Hello, Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. So it's been a couple of weeks now since I've had a chance to put out an odds and ends video and I am a little bit late getting some of these out, but it is time for me to do that. I've got some viewer mail and some uh, other gifts and stuff that have come in and I always like to try to recognize um, people when they send something to me. And I know some people out there have told me they don't really like seeing that. They see it kind of as bragging or whatever. Uh, if you do see it that way, I, I apologize. That's not how it is. I look at it, but when someone sends me a gift, I, I look at it as really being something from the whole YouTube community. And I like to share that so everybody can see it. And the person who sends it, I think in, in many cases, in most cases, they like to see uh, their little item uh, or whatever they send along showed and shared as well. So uh, I think this is an important part of what I do. And I typically do these in these odds and ends series. So, <coughs> excuse me, before we uh, get into that, I also wanted to comment. You just heard me coughing. Um, I, and I haven't had some videos out in a while. I've had a couple that I've put out the last couple of weeks, but I went about almost three weeks, I think, without getting a single video out. And a lot of that had to do with that coughing that you guys just heard. Uh, I came down with a really, really nasty case of bronchitis. And uh, it literally knocked me on my tail for a couple of weeks. And uh, between that and uh, being a real busy time still for me at work and, and having in the middle of fighting, trying to get over bronchitis, I'm traveling and uh, still trying to, to do what I need to do at work. And uh, I just, when I was at home on the weekends, uh, I just was not in any condition to get out and shop uh, and do anything. So. I took a little break for a little while. It was not by choice, I promise you. Uh, but uh, hopefully uh, we're back and we'll be able to keep some content coming to you guys. So enough on all that. Uh, I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and get into these uh, boxes and gifts and stuff that have come in and uh, share it with you guys. All right, so uh, this first box I got here, this was actually not mailed to me, but it was hand delivered to me by my good buddy, uh, Carl Shields. And uh, Carl lives up outside of Rockford, Illinois. And um, oh goodness, it's been several weeks ago now. Probably It was right before I came down with the bronchitis. Actually, that uh, there was one weekend in there that I didn't have a video that, um, well, I didn't have a video because I got sick when I got home, but uh, before I went off, uh, I uh, went up to North Georgia and uh, up in Chickamauga, Georgia and met up with a bunch of guys on the uh, uh, old woodworking machines forums at a little event that uh, Mike Danford held up there that I was invited to come to. So uh, uh, anyway, Carl had come down from Rockford along with several other guys on the OWWM um, uh, group and had a great weekend. Uh, worked on restoring some machinery. It was, it was a really hands-on weekend where everybody was kind of working on some projects and um, I was actually doing a lot of brazing up there. A lot of people brought busted up pieces of cast iron and I, was, uh, I spent most of the weekend helping braze stuff back together for people. But anyway, Carl brought this down for me. If you remember, I did a job for Carl back about a year ago uh, making some knives for a uh, miter trimmer and uh, Kind of as a thank you for that, uh, he wanted to, to give me something, and, uh, and what he's giving me here is a bunch of these. And uh, some of you guys may recognize these, some of you guys may not. Let me zoom you in here, and we'll talk about what these are and how they're used. All right, so what you are looking at, if you don't know what these are, these are called fillet tools. And uh, this was a tool that was used by pattern makers and uh, foundry men as well, uh, and probably had other uses as well, but they primarily were for the, uh, the foundry trade and the uh, pattern making trade uh, for doing casting work. And um, what you have here is basically a ball, a steel ball that is on the end of a stick. Some of them have two different size balls on, on each side. Some of these, like this one, it's just got one. Um, some of these uh, look like they were commercially made. Uh, some of these, like here we go, looks like they just took a ball bearing and um, somehow brazed it or uh, soldered it or something to the end of a nail. So some of these were definitely um, uh, shop made uh, tools uh, and it really doesn't matter. Uh, 
But what it's used for, uh, in the pattern making trade anyway, is uh, helping to put a fillet onto a pattern. So I'll tell you what, let me grab a pattern. So this is a pattern, a uh, wooden pattern that I made many years ago for a restoration job. It's a um, cover that actually fits over a gear. It had a shaft coming here and had a gear turning and there was a gear box and uh, the original one was missing. So we need to have a new casting made. So I made this uh, wooden pattern uh, and uh, sent it off to a foundry and had them cast this part for me. And uh, this is, on, I don't even remember exactly what machine this was on, but uh, uh, but anyway, you can see the end results uh, of, of what we have. But if you look around here, where we have, uh, you know, the intersection of two pieces in here, in a casting, you never want to have a sharp corner in these uh, corners in here uh, because that creates a very weak place in the metal when it, it cools and that you would very often get a fracture in there uh, when it was cooling. So instead, what you want is you want to have a little radius in there. Uh, and that radius is called a fillet. And depending on what you're doing, you would have different size fillets. So if you look at this ball, you know, it kind of matches that radius in there. Or you would choose, uh, you know, the one to match whatever radius it is that you wanted to put in here as a fillet. So uh, I think this one here just has some, um, I don't, it's like, I think I actually use maybe like some Bondo or something like that. Uh, or it may have been uh, some epoxy, I can't remember, and actually form that. Uh, but real commonly in pattern making, they used uh, leather fillet. And uh, this, is some, this is some leather fillet material here. If you look, it's kind of, uh, you know, on, on the end here, it's, it's kind of skeeved off. And what you would do with this, and, you know, you would put this down in the corner of your casting. And I've already, of course, it's already got a fillet in there, so it's not going to match in there perfectly. But you would glue this in place and you could actually use these tools. Let me find a, here we go, one here. And you would run this up and down on there and, um, and get it glued into place. Uh, and then that would be a nice fillet material uh, to put in these corners. They also made a wax fillet that was very commonly used. In fact, I've got some of that. I, I was, it's put up somewhere in the house. I don't keep it out in the shop because it will melt if it gets too hot. I couldn't find it right away, but it's a wax material. And the reason these uh, were made out of metal is, is you would actually have a, um, a little alcohol flame and you would heat this up and you would kind of melt that wax fillet in there. Uh, in fact, this is a uh, pattern that I picked up a while back that actually came out of a commercial foundry and mahogany pattern. And if you look right in here, you can see the difference color in there. And that's actually a wax fillet in there. And they have uh, put a, a like a, a probably a shellac or polyurethane finish or something on there to kind of harden it out. But they basically took one of these little uh, fillet tools at whatever radius that was and kind of worked that wax in there, uh, heating it up, melting it in there, and then uh, finishing over it. Uh, so anyway, th that's what the fillet tools are used for. They're also used in the foundry uh, to kind of repair uh, uh, your your molds and the sand. So if you had a corner and, and maybe it didn't, it you know, tore out a little bit of something, you could actually rub this in there and kind of repair the sand down inside your, uh, your molds. Uh, so foundrymen use these as well. But uh, anyway, Carl sent me a, a nice set of these. Um, very complete set uh, up to some bigger sizes. I have a couple of sizes uh, tucked away over in one of my drawers, but I don't have a set like this. So this would be a very nice addition. You can tell these have been used. Uh, they've actually got a lot of glue on them. Um, it looks like, or some type of adhesive, probably from where they were gluing these into place and it's just, they just need a good cleaning, but uh, these will be very serviceable and we'll put them back to use. So Carl, uh, thanks a lot for the uh, fillet tools. Um, we'll make a good home for them. And uh, it's very likely that down the road, you guys may see some of these uh, in some videos uh, if we do some more wooden pattern making, which is a, always a very likely thing around my shop because we're always needing to make patterns for doing uh, metal casting, making new parts for 
uh, things that are being restored. So up next here, I got a, actually a couple of packages that were sent to me from Carl Schuler. Carl is out in Richmond, Texas, and uh, contacted me a while back and wanted to send me some stuff and uh, got some real good things in here. So uh, what he sent me in the in the box, and I've already taken all the wrapping off of it here, but he, he sent me some Babbitt and Babbitt related items here. So. We got some mystery Babbitt here. Uh, I don't know what source this is. It'll get used. It might end up in a uh, hammerhead. Uh, I might use this in my lead hammer mold or something. I typically don't like to reuse um, old Babbitt unless I know what it is. This looks like a tin base lab Babbitt just looking at it, but I'm, I'm not sure. But I like to have some of this old stuff around. Uh, it comes in handy for a lot of little jobs, but uh, more importantly, he sent me a couple of ingots of Babbitt. And uh, so we got, uh, this is uh, American Smelting and Refining Company uh, 4X Nickel Babbitt. And uh, I've actually got some more of this. Uh, um, I've Anytime I find ingots of Babbitt that is recognizable and it's something that I uh, more or less know the content of, and this is some stuff I know the content of, you know, I like to get it. And uh, this other bar is actually also uh, 4X Nickel Babbitt. This one is from uh, Federated Metal Corporation uh, in San Francisco. I'm not... I, I, I may have some information on this. I think I've got some Federated uh, Metal stuff. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure. It seems like, seems like I may remember that these two companies merged at one time. I'm going to have to go back and look at my history, but this may actually be uh, the same material. Uh, he also sent along uh, some Babbitt Wright and um, got some good Babbitt Wright that looks like it's uh, fairly fresh. Of course, this is a damming material used when pouring Babbitt. Uh, so you would kind of, this is kind of like the consistency of Play-Doh and you can wrap it around uh, places where the molten Babbitt may run out. You need to dam it up. And uh, this stuff is getting hard to find, the Babbitt right is. Appreciate that, uh, Carl, uh, but that's not all that Carl sent. Also got another little envelope here. And uh, this one is actually not for me, but uh, instead this is for uh, Andy Knowlton. And uh, you may remember a while back, uh, Andy bought that um, that lathe, the um, LeBlanc lathe, and uh, Carl had a manual for 14 and 16 inch uh, tool and die makers lathe LeBlanc, and uh, he wanted Andy to have this. So I haven't even showed this to Andy yet, so he may actually see it on the video before I can get it in his hands. Uh, but anyway, uh, Carl, I, I appreciate it, and I'm sure that Andy will appreciate it. Uh, in case anybody um, has a 14 or 16 inch tool and die maker's lathe, uh, I scan this and uh, put it up on my website, vintagemachinery.org. Uh, there are tons and tons and tons of uh, old manuals and catalogs and stuff on all kinds of vintage machinery. Literally thousands of reprints uh, that can be downloaded absolutely free uh, that have been sent in by people all over the world. And uh, anyway, I scanned this one earlier and it is now up on the website in electronic form. So if anybody's needing this manual, you can go download it from, for free at my vintagemachinery.org website. So uh, thanks a lot, Carl. Uh, some great items. Uh, always glad to get some more Babbitt in the shop. I will put this down in my stash of Babbitt. And like I said, I've actually got some more of this exact kind. So uh, it will probably end up getting used in a project at some point in time. So thanks a lot. So another item that just came in uh, the other day, this is from Pete Stagg up in uh, Butler, New Jersey. And Pete had contacted me a couple of weeks ago, said he wanted to send me something, had seen me using uh, this item in a couple of my videos, and uh, he didn't even know what it was. And uh, he said, I don't need it, I'm gonna send it to you. So what is it? Again, on the Babbitt theme, we got a nice uh, Babbitt scraper here. Uh, I call it a Babbitt scraper. It can be used for doing lots of different scraping on a lot of different materials, but uh, these are great for scraping Babbitt. Uh, after you pour Babbitt, uh, you need to kind of get that, uh, that finish in there just right and fit to the shaft and you, with doing some bluing and, and uh, doing some test fits, you can knock off the high spots. These are great to just go in there and uh, you can get in there and just scrape off the high spots. 
uh, on your Babbitt and uh, really get that shaft running good. So this is, looks like a really nice one. It's a big one. Uh, I don't know that I've got one quite this big. And uh, this one is made by Miller's Falls. And uh, it's, I'll tell you that it is really nice to have a nice selection of these Babbitt scrapers in different sizes, uh, in different shapes, different forms, different bends on them because every single Babbitt pour seems like it's a little bit different. And uh, you know, I kind of have some favorite scrapers that I, I go reach for on your just everyday common jobs, but every now and then you get a something that's a little bit different or maybe it's tight getting into and you just need a different scraper. So uh, this will definitely come in handy. So I've got all my scrapers out at the museum uh, in my toolbox and uh, this one will be joining it uh, next time I'm at the museum. So thanks a lot, Pete, for uh, sending this along. And again, another very useful tool uh, that you'll probably see down the road uh, in some videos being used. So uh, next item here uh, comes from James up in Brooklyn, New York. And if you remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, James has sent down um, some broken castings on a Stanley number 55 hand plane that he wanted me to try to brace back together. And I did shot some video on that. Well, as a thank you for helping him out on that job, uh, James sent along a really neat item. It's a little pocket watch here. And uh, you guys, I've had some pocket watches in some of my other videos. James knew I like them. And uh, this is one that he found. It's uh, made by the South Bend Watch Company. And uh, he told me that he actually uh, did some repair work on it, which I found amazing uh, that he was capable of doing that. I would be lost trying to work on one of these. He actually replaced uh, some of the jewels in there, which are used as bearings uh, for some of the moving parts. And uh, he said he was very fortunate that it didn't require any major work. There were a couple other things he told me he did. I don't remember what they are, but I'm going to zoom you in. This is an absolutely beautiful watch. It runs. It keeps great time. Uh, I have... I, when I got it, I wound it up, set the time on it, and just left it on my desk and actually ran it for a couple of days, winding it up every day, until, or every, couple, every day until I went out of town for a while. And it ran for like three days and um, kept great time. So let me zoom you in here. All right, so maybe you guys can see this uh, with the glare on there, but uh, beautiful, beautiful watch. It's a fairly thin watch uh, compared to some of my other watches that I have, uh, which is nice. And... Uh, so the, on this one, let's see if I can get it to open up. The uh, front case, or front opens up, and this is how you actually set the time on this, is you uh, just move the hands in here uh, to set the time on this one instead of using the stem. Uh, but the front opens up, and in addition, uh, the back opens up as well, of course, to reveal uh, the watch works. And uh, I'll tell you what, hang on one second. All right, sorry about that. That back case is kind of hard to get open. I, but if you open it up, it actually comes in here, and there's another cover in here. This says South Bend Watch Company, South Bend, Indiana. I don't know if you can see that in the glare on the camera. Uh, and let's see, there's a little place right here to pry open the back. And, of course, you can see the uh, inside of the watch working there. Uh, with everything in operation and of course it's like most pocket watches um, I think they call this oh what's the term for it I can't remember there's a term for this this where they decorate the inside of this they use like a uh, um, engine lathe they call it to uh, put these different patterns on there but that was very typical with watch companies uh, they would really decorate the inside of these watches. And it's kind of amazing because most people never see the inside of a watch. The only people that see the inside of the watches are the watchmakers themselves who work on them. And that is kind of a sign of the quality of it. So uh, this one says it's adjusted uh, to four positions. It's got 19 jewels. So this is a, a nice quality watch in the USA by the South Bend uh, Watch Company. So uh, very, very nice gift, very much appreciated. Um, particularly what I am most impressed on this is that James actually uh, worked on this watch himself 
and uh, got it back to running. Uh, again, he said he was very fortunate that there was nothing major wrong with it. I just needed a few little things, but uh, it runs well, keeps good time. Uh, this will become a uh, treasured item of mine. So thank you very much, um, James. I really, really appreciate the craftsmanship in these antique watches. And I appreciate you uh, uh, thinking of me and sending this to me. So thanks a lot. All right, so uh, next items I'm going to bring in here in just a minute and show to you, but a little little background on this. So late last week, I got an email from uh, Forbes Matthews, uh, who lives a couple hours north of me up in uh, kind of middle Georgia. Gay Georgia is the name of the, the town there that uh, I went to. And uh, he told me, he said he saw my video on the dividing head uh, that I did a while back, and uh, uh, saw where I was looking for a chuck to fit the dividing head. And he said, I've got a little... A uh, little, uh, what was it, eight and a quarter inch chuck that he said was surplus to him. He had picked it up uh, somewhere along the way, and if I would like to have it, it was mine. I got back with him and said, I'll tell you what, I will just make a trip up there uh, this coming Sunday uh, when I got out of church. So after church on Sunday, we, uh, I loaded up, uh, drove up to Gay, Georgia, a couple hours up the road, and uh, he had this very nice uh, Cushman uh, chuck company. Uh, our Cushman Chuck, three jaw chuck, uh, eight and a quarter inches in diameter, which would be just right uh, for the dividing head. He gave me this chuck and he said, that's not all. I said, I got a couple other things I want to send back with you. So um, first here is a nice, <laughs> uh, a big 20 in chuck, uh, Jacob's Chuck. This has got a number five Morse taper on it. Uh, appears to be in, in really good shape. Again, he said it was surplus. Uh, Forbes told me that uh, he's bought out some uh, a bunch of stuff at machine shop auctions and uh, when, when shops are going out and he ends up getting you know buying stuff in big lots and he has had a bunch of some extra stuff surplus stuff as he called it um, he also gave this to me um, which is a little tool post holder of some kind it's made by Warner Swayze, so I'm assuming it was probably used on either a turret lathe or a boring mill or something like that made by turret, by, by a Warner Swayze. But it's basically, it's got a T-slot in the bottom where this clamps down on, um, on I'm thinking probably a, a boring mill. You would clamp this down the table and uh, you could uh, adjust the height of the cutter. It's got a, you know, a little... Um, angle in there to adjust it up and down. Of course, you can tighten it up and get it, adjust the height of your cutter. Uh, but he said he didn't have any use for it. Thought I might be able to find something for, to do with it. So um, anyway, I said, yeah, I can probably use that for something. So uh, uh, it's a Warner and Swayze M4130. So some of you guys, I haven't even got on the internet to try to look it up. Some of you guys will probably tell me exactly what it is before I get a chance to do that. And then as I was leaving, uh, he said, I got another surplus chuck for you here. So uh, he threw this into the pile. So this is another three jaw chuck. And um, I said, well, that might be something we can put on the lodge and ship if we can get it working. So this one's kind of cruddy. It's got a bunch of gunk on it. It doesn't look that rusty because there, there's a lot of grease and just gunk on it. I think it's going to clean up pretty well. I'll probably end up taking this chuck apart, uh, cleaning it inside out. And putting it back together so I was let's see I was messing with this earlier and found the name on here so it says made in England I can't see out of my glasses made in England um, Edgewick um, Unicentric I, I'm having a hard time reading it so EDG WICK Unicentric made for Alfred Herbert Limited uh, Coventry. So some of you um, English guys may be able to tell me about this. It looks to me like it's got lines on here and this looks like uh, metric uh, measurements on there, which is no big deal. Uh, I haven't done anything with this, tried messing with it yet or anything like that to even see if it works. Uh, it is kind of unique. Uh, it's got the, the jaws on here that clamp in, but there's like little serrations in here where you can adjust this or, or put this in a lot of different places uh, on there. So, you know, these look like specialty uh, 
chuck pieces are a little bit different than some of them. It's actually on a T slot in here uh, where these adjust up and down. And again, you got all these little serrations in here that these lock in place on. So I'm not, again, I'm not exactly sure uh, what this chuck was originally intended for. It may have some special purpose. Again, I need to look it up, but a uh, unicentric uh, chuck is what it's called. So anyway, so that's, uh, that's what we got from Forbes. Uh, Forbes, if you're watching, greatly enjoyed uh, the visit. Uh, and uh, I'm going to have to make another trip up sometime where I can spend a little more time because uh, you got a lot of fun stuff up there. And, uh, and it's, just, it's just a neat piece of property you have and a neat shop that you have. I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, the visit. And thank you so much uh, for the items. Uh, so on the dividing head chuck, uh, we're going to have to make a back plate for this. Uh, it's an oddball size thread on my dividing head, four and a half threads per inch. I uh, can't remember the diameter, so I think like an inch and a quarter or two and a quarter inches. But uh, anyway, we're going to have to make the back plate for this, so that'll probably be a project coming up uh, down the road. Um, but I'm really excited about getting this and putting it on the dividing head. So guys, that's going to wrap up another issue of Odds and Ends. I hope you enjoyed that. I will make a comment that um, if you've sent me something in the last couple of weeks and you didn't see it in this video, shoot me an email and let me know because I really think I had something else that uh, I was supposed to show and I can't remember what it is. So please, 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 if you sent something and you haven't seen it uh, in one of the videos here, uh, let me know so I can make sure I get it in. Uh, it's like I said, it's been several weeks since I've been able to get out in the shop and do one of these and I've gotten behind and things have kind of gotten scattered a little bit. So I, I hope I got everything covered. I really, really do. If I didn't, I apologize to whoever ahead of time and we'll get you in the next one if you'll shoot me a reminder. So as always, uh, thank you guys for watching. Appreciate it so much. Uh, and it is very nice to be back in the shop. Uh, my health is improving greatly and I, I think I'll be able to start being a little more regular again with my videos, uh, which I'm really excited about. It was in spring is, is here in South Georgia where I'm at. Uh, the grass is green. In fact, I'm going to have to cut the grass here or cut mostly weeds, but also the grass uh, this, uh, this week. The trees are bloom, budding out with new leaves. The flowers are in bloom. Uh, and What's I'm excited about is we've got some warmer weather. Uh, the days are longer with uh, the daylight savings going back. Uh, so what that's going to mean for me is more time to get out and shop and do some things and the weather being a little more agreeable to getting out and shop and doing some things. So hopefully we'll be able to kick up uh, the videos here uh, soon and bring you guys some more stuff. So again, thanks for watching and uh, we'll talk to you later.